I bought one of the new MacBook Pros, fully maxed out, 2300 bucks, not bad. And it's like revolutionary. It's the biggest leap I've seen since the 80s in personal computers. And it just might be enough to convince everybody to really move from Windows over to Mac or to upgrade the Mac that you already have. But it has some serious problems. So I'm gonna go over my real world experiences with it, working with it for the last couple of weeks. I'm not talking benchmarks, I'm talking like actually using it for photo and video editing. I'm gonna tell you what my life is like so you can make an actual buying choice. And full disclosure, I've been a full on Windows nerd since the 90s. I've written like 25 books for Microsoft Press. I have literally been sponsored by Intel, but None of those people are paying me now, and I bought this Apple out of my own pocket, so I can be fully unbiased here. Quick plug for our store, Northrop Photo. If you want to learn photography, the art of it, the science of it, we have a ton of training materials. We have books on learning Lightroom and Photoshop. We have presets to make your pictures look better. All of it, huge discount with the coupon code HOLIDAY25, 25% off. Go to Northrop.photo and hurry, because that's just for this holiday season. First of all, this new computer has the M1 ARM chip, and that is a big deal. Because for a long time, Apple's been using chips from Intel to power their computers. Same chips that you'd be getting in a Windows PC. And you know what? They're not getting much better. They've gotten just like incrementally better. Like I would get a new computer after three or four years and I'd do some tests and stuff and it would be like, it'd be like 8% faster. When it used to be, it would double every two years. Moore's Law is long dead, like up until now, really. We haven't seen that kind of leap. So what is unique about this M1 ARM chip? Well, first of all, it has a drastically different instruction set. And that's a really nerdy way of saying it speaks a different language from the Intel chips that power almost all computers right now. And that means that if your apps are gonna run on it, well, they kind of have to learn this new language. That means that the developers have to take their old apps and port them over to the new environment. And it could just be recompiling it, but it's probably also writing a bunch of extra code. And that means, well, none of your current apps will work natively. And that's a really big deal to understand. There is, however, what they call an emulator, which is like a translator between different languages. That means that your brand new M1 ARM MacBook Pro will run all of your old Mac apps through this emulator. But the emulator takes a huge performance toll. Things like Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, Premiere Pro, right now all of those need to go through the emulator. And I'll tell you in a little bit how much that performance is really impacted by it. I also want to talk about transistor density. I'm getting really nerdy here. But if you look at the brains of the computer, the central processing unit, there are tiny little transistors in it, just millions of them. And the closer those transistors can be, the smaller the transistors are, the more powerful everything runs. So Intel, probably the biggest processor manufacturer for computers in the world, has been trying to make them smaller and smaller and smaller. And they're already really small. They're measured in nanometers, which is just, it's like a really small <laughs> measurement. And since like 2014, they've been using what's called a 14 nanometer process, meaning that those little transistors are about 14 nanometers wide. They've been trying to get it down to seven nanometers and they've been failing. And so they decided they're gonna launch 10 nanometers and that seems like it's getting kind of delayed. So Intel, struggling to get from 14 nanometers down to 10 nanometers to see some kind of performance improvement. And what does Apple do? They release a MacBook at five nanometers. That's like if Ferrari was trying to get their zero to 60 times from four seconds to 2.9 seconds and suddenly Lamborghini's like, Here's one at 1.8 seconds. Like it just completely blows away the competition. The chip in this thing is so much faster than the Intel chips, even in your top end, big, huge desktops. And a big part of that reason is the smaller transistors. But the other part is what they call the reduced instruction set. And it's like a simpler language. It's like if you were trying to learn Chinese and then somebody came along and said, oh, I made up a language with just uh, 15 words. And Obviously, that 15 word language would be a lot simpler to use, right? That's kind of what it's like. So it's those two things combined and it is a huge breakthrough. But like I said, it has to translate out all of your old apps into this new language to run and that slows everything down. Good news, bad news. <laughs> when it's translating, it does a really good job of uh, keeping up with older MacBooks your big Intel desktops, 
whatever. I did extensive side-by-side -side testing and living with Lightroom and Classic and Adobe Photoshop for all you photo editors out there, and it's basically the same. My $7,400 MacBook Pro 2019 totally spec'd out is about as fast as my $2,300 M1 ARM when it's running emulated software. So you could switch and you wouldn't get anything, but at the same time you wouldn't lose anything. And in the future, more and more of these apps are going to be translated so they're speaking the language natively and everything is really going to run much faster. But we don't know how much faster on these like crucial apps that we use day to day until they actually release them. But like I said, you're not going to get much hardship out of it now. Some apps, especially those written by Apple, are running natively. They've already been translated. And the one that we use the most, you know, because we got a YouTube channel, is Final Cut Pro. Final Cut is such an awesome video editing app that that's what initially drove me, the Windows nerd, to switch to Mac because I love Final Cut. It just makes our business smoother. It just It's more reliable than Premiere Pro. It's quicker than Premiere Pro. Even going from a desktop to a laptop, it was better. But when I switched to the M1 ARM for my 2019 spec'd out MacBook Pro, it's unbelievable. First, in a very practical way, we recently switched to filming with the Sony A7S Mark III. We film in 4K at 60 frames per second using 10-bit video at 422. And if that doesn't make any sense, just know it's like super thick, like high quality video. But that puts a big burden on the computer. And computers haven't been increasing in their power in the same rate that video cameras have. And as a result, my video editing performance got slower and slower and slower. I could mitigate this with Final Cut. All I do is I just select a checkbox and I turn on proxies. And now when I import my video, I, I have to wait like eight hours for it to generate proxies for all my big, huge, high quality video editing files. And these proxies are just like a shrunken down copy of it that I can edit and then render a high quality version later. It's fine. It works, but it means I don't record, edit, and publish a video on the same day like I used to. Now I record a video, I import it onto the computer, I then wait for the proxies to render, and then probably the next morning I do the editing and it slows the whole thing down. Well, I don't have to do that with my $2,300 M1 MacBook Pro because it can play those files back in real time. And in a very real way, that improves my workflow, saves me time, and saves me money, and will basically pay for itself, no problem at all. But the rendering times are absolutely dramatic. I rendered a sample video that we had edited with titles and coloring and effects and stuff, and it was about like a five minute 4K60 video. And my MacBook Pro, again, $7,400, took 13 minutes to render it. That $2,300 M1 ARM laptop took less than four minutes to render it. So we're looking at about like three and a half times faster rendering performance. And again, that's the kind of thing that saves me time and saves me money, makes me more productive. You know, you don't have to be sitting there while it's rendering. You can go get yourself some coffee or something, but I don't know how many times I've rendered something and then realized, oh, I misspelled something in a title, so I need to go back and re-render it again. I often end up rendering videos multiple times, so the, if I can reduce that time by a factor of three, that is huge. But the fact that the computer is also one-third the price is absolutely mind-blowing, and that's why this is such a breakthrough. And I can only hope that we see similar performance gains when we get native photo editing apps like Lightroom Classic and Photoshop ported over. And I think we will, because I have been using Lightroom on my iPad Pro, and I was blown away by the performance. And when I reviewed it, nobody believed that it was outperforming my big, huge desktop computer, but it was, it really was. So am I telling you to get an iPad? No, because the iPad didn't have operating system features like good file management. It couldn't connect by NAS easily, things that the proper Mac OS can actually do. So now that we know the performance is mind blowing, I'm gonna go over some of the hardware. The screen on it is beautiful. All the MacBooks have this true tone screen, which I find is pure, accurate color, but it's also very smart. So if I'm sitting in my office and 
there's bright sun in the room, it adapts to that. When the sun goes down and the color temperatures change and I flip on artificial lights, it adapts to all of that. And no amount of screen calibration that I know of is quite as intelligent. And for creators like myself, where color matching is really, really important, it is mind-blowing. But on the other hand, the screen itself is a little bit of a letdown. It's, it's not a touch screen, which is a convenience, but it also has really thick bezels all around it. Now, with that, I'm saying I think it's a fantastic screen, but it's still kind of a letdown that it doesn't have those like high-tech features that we expect from like modern laptops, like a bezel-less screen. The touch bar on it is, it's fine. I don't hate it like a lot of people do. It works and I use it sometimes. But I think the fundamental problem with it is that two thirds of the time I'm using a laptop, I'm actually using an external keyboard because I'm sitting at my desk. And when I'm at my keyboard, there's no Mac keyboard that has a touch bar on it. So my fingers are not trained to use the touch bar. I can only use it when I'm using the laptop itself, which basically if I'm traveling or if I'm in the backyard enjoying the weather and trying to get some work done. Same thing with the fingerprint reader. It's right there on the touch bar, but because my desk keyboard doesn't have it, I'm not in the habit of using it. So they mostly get wasted even when I'm away from it. I'll say they moved the escape key to be a physical key instead of a touch bar key. That I totally approve of. The keyboard also, by the way, feels great. It's a little bit, has a little bit better travel than my MacBook 2019. Okay, the ports are always a point of contention on the MacBooks, and this is terrible. The ports on it are terrible. It has two USB-C ports on the left side only. It has no regular USB ports. It has no ports on the right side. And the way my desk is set up, I only need ports on the right side. <laughs> My regular MacBook has four USB-C ports, two on the left, two on the right, and I use them all, almost all the time because I have three monitors, because I have a 10 gig Ethernet that I plug in, because I have a USB label printer, and I have an SD card reader. Like, I need all the ports, and taking away two ports is kind of unacceptable. But you know what they did give me is a stupid headphone jack. And I know a lot of people love headphone jacks, but I'm all about my... AirPod Pro now, and I, I don't need a headphone cable, but you know what I would like? An SD card slot, because modern computers are too dumb to send my files wirelessly to my laptop in any sort of intelligent way. So the quickest way is still to pull out this tiny floppy disk and stick it into an SD card reader. And these are made for creators. Why don't they appreciate that a lot of us still have to use these outdated computers with SD cards and just give us a tiny little SD card slot? Okay, storage and memory are also a bit of a problem if you're used to a high-end computer. Maxed out, the most you can get, 16 gigs of RAM. And you know what? It's been enough. Things are still faster than they used to be, mostly because the processing power is so high. But I do edit huge video and I know more memory would benefit it. The storage is also limited to two terabytes of internal storage. And if you're used to using a smartphone or a tablet, that seems like a lot. But my MacBook Pro has four terabytes and I am constantly filling it up because we have, we have video projects where, especially with the proxies and stuff, it will be over a terabyte in size and we're frequently juggling three, four, five different projects that we have in different stages in the pipeline to get videos to you guys. So we need as much storage as possible. We have a network attached storage which has more than 250 terabytes of storage where long-term storage is held. So two terabytes, not really enough. Now, there is a 16-inch MacBook Pro out there, but it has the Intel processor. So you're stuck in this awkward place where if you want the good performance, you have to go with a low-end laptop. And for me, maybe it's better just to wait. Wake up. Don't do that. Monitors. It only supports one external monitor. So you can have this screen and some external monitor going at the same time. But me and my desk, I have three 4K monitors plus that screen and I use them. I'll have a browser tab open here and I'll have Slack on a different window. And then when I'm editing video, I'll have full screen display on one or I'll have filters and such on one. I need more than one monitor and it's weird to mix and match this small true tone 13 inch display with some kind of big screen. The only thing you could really do if you need more space is to get the new 6K Apple monitor. This does support that huge 6K screen. And it's, it's very confusing to me because that's like the same resolution as two 4K monitors. So I don't know why I can't drive two 4K monitors. It seems like it could, but it 
can't. And also that 6K display costs you about 6K. It's an outrageous price. And I'm sure the monitor is great. And I still might do it. I might trade all my three monitors for one big 6K display just so I can get the benefit of this ARM chip right away because that's how serious the workflow benefits for me are. But still, it's a huge disappointment. Why limit me to one monitor? And by the way, you can't hook up an external GPU. Right now, I have my MacBook Pro hooked up to a big powerful GPU, which is great for like number crunching, it like reduces rendering time sometimes. And maybe most importantly, it lets me run a whole bunch of big powerful monitors without taxing the computer too much, but it doesn't support eGPUs. Like, I don't know if that's planned. They haven't told us that. Just right now, they don't work at all. And honestly, they never worked that great with the old Intel-based MacBook Pros. They were always a pain. It's like, it's always crashing, like it only technically works, but it's like they never really put in good support. This is also buggy. Like the new Mac OS version, Sierra, whatever it is, is buggy, even on my Intel-based Macs. But this thing, it, it crashes on a regular basis. It'll just shut down every now and then, and some apps just don't work quite right. And people have problems with the Bluetooth, though I really haven't, and, and the Wi-Fi is a little bit flaky. I assume they're going to fix this, though. Well, they actually never know. Sometimes they just leave bugs and just like, make a new laptop and just kind of move on, leave you behind. But I bet they're probably gonna fix it, but you might wanna just wait because those bugs will eventually go away because there's a new M1X chip coming out that's gonna power a 16 inch MacBook Pro that should give you these performance benefits with more memory, with more storage, with hopefully support for more monitors. And they're expecting that in 2021. So help me out, I want your opinion. Should I try to move to this and deal with having only one monitor and deal with having half the storage space? Or should I keep my Intel-based MacBook Pro and have to deal with rendering proxies and waiting longer for my videos to publish to YouTube? I don't know the answer, but either way, if you wanna check it out, you can use this link here. It's in the description too. In the comments, I'd like to hear your feelings on the whole Mac versus Windows thing because as a longtime Windows guy, I had so many people telling me, oh, like life is so much better in the Mac world. Like everything just, it works so straightforward and you never have to fuss with stuff and there's no security problems. And like that all seems like nonsense because all of my Macs have been buggy. They're always buggy. And you know what? They seem fine if you use it just like this. If you don't attach any accessories to it, it's just fine. But we run high-end video editing system here. I have, you know, 10 gigabit Ethernet, which almost nobody uses, and I have three monitors, which almost nobody uses, and a big honking eGPU, which nobody uses. And in the Windows world, there's much better support for these sort of high-end niche accessories. In the Mac world, I don't think that many people really use these high-end things because I find them to be buggy, and I find support for them to be poor. Go try to find updated drivers for these things. Go try to get support for them. Call Apple to get these weird accessories working right. And there's like no help. When there's some crazy bug in the Windows world, I Google the error message and I find some other nerd out there who's figured out a workaround. You Google an error message that you get from your Mac, there's nothing. It's just, you just hear the sound of crickets chirping as nobody is helping you. <laughs> I do have frustrations with the Mac system overall, but what keeps me grounded in the system is my love for Final Cut, which actually is just the best video editor I've ever used. Anyway, in the comments down below, I'd like to hear your own thoughts. Don't forget to subscribe because we have lots more tutorials coming. We're gonna teach you photography. We have uh, lots of reviews coming about cool cameras like this Nikon Z5, and we have a sale going on at Northrop.photo. Use the coupon code HOLIDAY25 for 25% off all of our award-winning photography education. Thanks and bye.